something with that because those generational curses have come to a close this month. We've determined that everything that's passed down from generation to generation that's negative and doesn't belong in God's people's lives, we cast it out in Jesus' name. We say come out of our lives in the name of Jesus, never to return. And then this month, this is a month of old, uh, those generational things being stopped right here. This is the end. E-N-D, end of that. Never to follow us anymore. But Paul, oh, so Timothy had a Greek father, a Jewish mother, and a Jewish grandmother. And these, uh, the God's people, they were praying, and Paul even mentions in, uh, in uh, 1 Timothy, I believe it is, 1, 5, that, uh, that mentions the faith of, Tim, of Tim, Timothy, Timotheus, Timothy's mother and grandmother. That's the place where Paul mentions that. And he says, he says something interesting that I noticed just before daylight this morning. He said something interesting. He was talking about the faith that was in Timothy's grandmother and his mother. And he said, I believe, and I'm paraphrasing it. He said, I believe that that faith that was in your grandmother and in your mother is in you. It's been, it's in your DNA. It's in your genes. It's in your blood. Faith is in your blood. He said, so, he said I believe that in a way what he was saying was I believe that they're in you. That his grandmother and his mother, they were in him. Do you believe that? Yeah. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Does it not say that? Yes. Now, what's this? If to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and it is because 2 Corinthians says it is, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, So if, I'm just going to throw this in here. So if you've lost someone, like a brother or a mother or a sister or a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, father or mother, if, they're, if to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, my question is to you born again people, how many in here is born again? How many has been saved? If you have it, we take care of that in a few seconds. Amen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My question is to you born again people, where is the Lord? Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Ask you to forgive me. So where is Jesus now? Where is the Lord now? He's not only seated at the right hand of God. He's in you. I'm in you, he said, and you're in me. I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me, and I'm in you, and you're in me, and the Father's in me, and I'm in the Father, and we're in you, and you're in us. So, in one realm, where are those that have gone on before you that are absent from their body, but they're present with the Lord? Do I need to say anything else? I got a son that's passed away. I got a mother and a father that's passed away. Uh, brother-in-laws and father-in-law and mother-in-law 
that I cared, all those I cared a lot about. They've left this realm and gone to, is the cliche is a better place. Amen. And it's definitely a better place. <laughs> Come on in, guys. But so I look at that now. My son John that passed from this life on March the 9th of 2014, he's not only in heavenly places, he's in me. Amen. Are you with me? And I don't even know how I got on that. But... But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and the Lord is everywhere, and he's in me. Your brother's in you, too. He's in me, too. So when, when your mother and your sister's in you, huh? So, uh, they're not that far away. Let me say that. We're surrounded about, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, by this so great a cloud of witnesses. Those that have gone on before us. Where it talks about that group in another place, it talks about multitudes and multitudes of the spirits of just men and women that have gone on before. We're surrounded by it. They're not somewhere way off somewhere. Not somewhere way off that some mystic place way off in the sweet by and by. No, no, they're, they're around us. We're compass, the, the King James calls it compass. What does that mean? That means surrounded by. We're in engulfed in that. We're immersed in that. Is anybody with me? Yes. We're immersed in those that have gone on before us. You know, when I understand that, that helps me on the days I want to be sad because my son's gone, or my friend Brother Terry's gone, or my friend Tommy's gone, or my grandmother, or grandfather, or mom and dad. Aunts, aunts, uncles, uh, brothers, sisters. The days that, that I want to feel sad, I have to remind myself, hey, I can touch them. They're right here. They're with me. They're in me. They're with, they're with the Lord, all right. But, but we're compassed about. Not somewhere way off that if we're good and we do everything we're supposed to do, we get to see them one day. No, being good won't do it either. The blood of Jesus is what does it. Thank you, Lord. So, Paul had a spiritual son named Timothy, and he was Timothy's mentor, if you will. And so he had to keep Timothy stirred up to do his job right at Pierce Black. He said, don't neglect the gift that's in you, Timothy. You've been given a gift by God. It was, it was announced or released by the presbytery, the men and women of God and the Apostle Paul praying for Timothy and laying their hands on Timothy and speaking out those that prophetic utterance that came from the Spirit of God and declaring him as a pastor and teacher and a prophet to the Ephesus. He, they, he was sent to Ephesus by God and Ephesus was a wild place. 
uh, all kinds of sin going on in Ephesus. Uh, it is it is told. This is not in the Bible now, but the tradition, if you will, says that Timothy was killed by a group of pagan worshipers when he confronted them at a festival where they were celebrating. They were celebrating this goddess and in that celebration, they they did uh, they had all kind of immoral sex acts and murder. They murdered people, human sacrifice, if you will. They were murdering people and having immoral things going on. And Timothy, the legend or the tradition goes that. <clears throat> that he confronted them about that and they beat him to death. He died somewhere between 70 and 80 years old, but it was not of natural causes. He, 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 they beat him so bad with clubs that, uh, and then some Christians rescued him, but he died two days later. Is the, that's how the story goes. But, but Paul was constantly urging this young preacher, young man of God, to neglect not the gift that was in him. That gift came from prophecy or from the word of God through someone speaking to him. Prophecy, you know, we talked about this last week. Prophecy comes in a lot of forms, but prophecy, uh, one of the main meanings or the, the main uh, definition, if you will, of prophecy is speaking under the inspiration of God or speaking words that are inspired by God to you and you speak it out. That's one of the main ways of prophecy. Prophecy, you can act out prophecy. You, can, you know, the Bible's full of parabolic prophecies where people's lives had prophesied about something. See, and you, that will help you understand the Bible about as much as anything when you learn that these people in here's lives was a prophecy. Read, read some of the minor prophets like Hosea. Hosea's life was a prophecy. His marriage was a prophecy. His children were a prophecy. So there's many ways that God uses to prophesy or to speak his will out where we can receive it or reject it. So, and we talked about last week how that Jesus, Jesus did things because it was prophesied. It's, I think it's eight times in the book of Matthew it says that Jesus Christ went and did whatever it was he's talking about he was doing in that, in that context there because it was spoken by the prophets. So when that was spoken out, God says, I'm going to perform that. See, here, here's one of the main parts of prophecy. Let me, let me tell you something about New Testament prophecy before I say anything else. Are you interested in this? Yeah. New Testament. See, the prophets of old in the Old Testament, if you will, I don't like to call anything of God old, but their task, one of their tasks was to warn the people. And, if, and they would warn the people, if you don't stop your sinning, this is going to happen. You know, uh, I mean, God prophesied hundreds of years before the children of Israel was in captivity in Egypt that they were going to be in captivity for 400 years. And, and they were. And then a little more because Moses lost his temper. Moses losing his temper and killing somebody cost them 40 more years. 
And at 390 years, when the children of Israel had been in bondage, and God said they're going to be in there at least 400 years, at 390 of that, Moses went berserk and killed an Egyptian, and it cost them 40 more years. So instead of 400 years, they were in captivity 430 years because at 390 is when Moses messed up. It cost them a generation. It cost them 40 more years. So God said 400 years, a man on earth messed up and delayed it. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. So, so in other words, can we postpone God's promise? It sounds like we can, doesn't it? By our words and our actions. So Moses cost them 40 years. Thank you, Lord. So, thank you, Jesus. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. How did that gift get in him? By the spoken word of God or prophecy. Now, the New Old Testament prophets, one of their main tasks was to warn the people. If you don't stop doing this, this is going to happen to you. If you don't stop doing this, this is going to happen to you. That was the Old Testament prophecy. And now, not all of it wasn't that way, but much of it was warning people, if you don't stop doing this, this is going to happen. You're going to pay the consequences. So, uh, New Testament prophecy, here comes, here comes all these prophetic words down through the ages. Uh, did you know that God prophesied to the devil in the garden when Adam messed up that there was a Messiah coming? There was a prophet coming that would take back everything that the devil had stolen from mankind. He prophesied that in the garden when he told Satan, there's one coming. He said, there's one coming. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. That was in the garden. And then every prophet that came down the line there, came down the road, everyone that came riding in on his donkey, every one of them, they had something to say or act out that said that there's a Savior coming. Every one of them. And that word kept being spoken and spoken. Now you better get over this. That word kept being spoken and spoken and spoken, spoken or prophesied, if you will, until the Bible says in St. John chapter 1, the word became flesh. Actually, in the Hebrew, it says the word became flesh and blood. It took, or it was, a few thousand years into the fourth 1,000 year period from Adam to Jesus that had been prophesied and prophesied and prophesied and acted out and acted out. It says I was, Hosea 12, 10, 12, 12, 10. Read it, read it. Uh, you'll find out which one it is. But it says, I've beseeched you. I've pleaded with you. I'm putting it in paraphrase. Uh, and 
spoken to you by visions and dreams and words and by parables acted out by the prophets. When you get a hold of that, that he's speaking to us by the spoken word and by parallels and parables acted out by the prophets, it will change your life how you understand and read the Bible and study the Bible. He said, and then the New Testament, God said, told the Old Testament prophets, you warn the people, tell them what's going to happen, tell them destruction is coming if they don't quit their sinning, that kind of thing. But when you slip on over into the New Testament, where that one that they've been prophesying about for thousands of years showed up, Glory to God, he showed up. When he showed up and he acted out the word of God and he spoke the word of God and then when that one that had become flesh, the words that became flesh and dwelt among us, when he poured his sacrifice out, Glory to God, brother. When he paid the price. When he, he what's this? See, people blame the Jews for killing Jesus. No, sin killed Jesus. We killed him. Everybody killed him. Sin killed him. He became sin. That we might become the righteousness of yes, God. Yes, thank you. Are y'all with me? Yes, thank you. Lord. He became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. And when He came, and when He lived the life as a human being on earth, and spoke God's word, but when He died, He said, "Nobody takes my life." No man takes my life, he said. I lay it down. Nobody takes it from me. I lay it down. I lay my life down. And he said, no greater love. There's no greater love than this, than a man give his life for his friend. He gave his life. He bare our burdens. Thank you, Lord. Paul told Timothy, don't neglect what was spoken about you. Uh-oh. He said, neglect not that words that were spoken in you that caused the gift to be in you, that caused, gave you the supernatural ability to do what God's called you to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Words, those spoken words are the, the one of the most powerful things in this world. Proverbs, Proverbs 12, verse 18 says, there are those that speak like the piercing of a sword. But the tongue of the wise is help. There are those that speak like the piercing of a sword. Their words are sharp. Proverbs has another verse. I'm not going to tell you where it is. You're going to have to look it up. Has another verse that says, the words of a tail bearer or somebody that's making something up. I'm sure me and you've never had anybody lie about us. <laughs> but the, he said the words of a tail bearer can go into a man, now I'm paraphrasing, go into a man's heart and wound him. So, 
if there are those that speak like the piercing of a sword and words can go in and wound you, then words can go in and heal you. Yes, amen. Then words can save you. Words can love on you. Words can cause you to prosper. It said the elders in the Ezra, the elders builded, and they prospered through the prophecies or the prophesying or the words spoken by two men, two people. <clears throat> Zechariah and who was the other one? I was just checking to see if you remembered. <laughs> Look it up. Ezra 6. I believe it's Ezra 6, about verse, let me see if I've got it written down. 14, maybe. 6, 14. Ezra 6, 14. Ezra's in your Bible, too. It's in there. <laughs> 6.14 Haggai the prophet and Zechariah right thank you Lord so Paul speaking to Timothy watch what he says he says oh I ain't got much time watch what he said he said uh, neglect not don't neglect in other words, you could say don't neglect the words that were spoken to, over you. Or don't neglect the words in this word of God that you read. Because there's gifts in this word. There's prosperity in this word. There's ability to do things in this word that we don't know we can do. Um, Pam likes to watch the Olympics, so I watch some of it with her. Toyota's one of their sponsors, and they've got a new commercial that says, Start Your Impossible. I, I like that. Let's get started on our impossible. Yes. Uh, I tell you what, I've done heard too many t things about, you can't do this. <laughs> you can't do that. I know somebody that tried that. I know I got a friend that tried that. He went broke. Well, you're not that friend. Amen. I'm not that friend. Uh, I, what, what about when they tell you well, nobody out of your family's ever made, made this, done this? You had never amounted to anything. That's, 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 yes. See, uh, whatever was in your natural family, you've been born again. That's right. Whatever's, whatever, whatever's going on in your past, you've been born again. Whatever you did uh, a year ago or 10 years ago or 50 years ago, you've been born again. You've been born anew. Yes. The word calls it being born anew. That means that old clown that you're thinking about and talking about it, he don't exist anymore. That's right, yes. He passed away. All things become new, and all things are of God. So in other words, you've got a new opportunity to start over today. Yes. It's up to us. Thank you, Lord. He said, we laid hands on you. We prophesied to you. And then in verse 15, he said, now meditate on these things. Verse 15, meditate on what, meditate on the, what you heard God say about you. Meditate on what you, that men and women of God have spoken over you. 
Uh, and then when the devil tries to remind you that uh, well, nobody in your family has ever done that, say, well, uh, I got a lot bigger family than you know about. Nobody in your family has ever amounted to anything. Nobody in your family has ever uh, graduated from college. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> I have got promises of God right here in Deuteronomy 29, believe verse 20, 19 maybe. It says, Read the words of this covenant and do them. And you will prosper in all that you do. That's my formula for success. That's one, two, three, my formula. Read the words of the covenant. Number two, do them. Number three, I'm going to prosper. That, that's, that's your formula. When Jesus came along, when Yahshua came, and he died, and he gave up his spirit temporarily, he opened the door. He opened the door for you to move past anything that anybody can think or ask about or for you. It's in here, and now we've got to get busy prophesying what God said. Listen, I, I'm just like everybody else. I, I kind of slack up every once in a while, but the Lord's trying to direct us now. You better get to talking, Lord. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed. Be thou removed. Be thou cast into the sea. And I say the sea of the word of God. All these mountains that come along in my life, I'm casting them into the sea of the word of God. Whosoever shall say this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith, he shall have whatsoever he saith. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe. You know, believe and faith is the same word. When you look them up, the words are translated believe and faith in the New Testaments. When you're believing, you're fainting. <laughs> you're fainting. If I'm believing, I'm fainting. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them. When you receive it, do you receive it when it shows up? No, you receive it when you pray. That's right. That, that's the reason that it don't ever show up a lot. Somebody don't don't shout me down now. The reason it doesn't show up a lot is because we didn't believe we received it when we prayed it. Amen. Is anybody listening to me? Yes. We, we got to believe we receive when? When we pray. He said, you have not because you ask not. But he also said, uh, I'm going to keep going for a few minutes. Okay? Mm -hmm. Y'all won't fire me now. Never. That preacher too long winded. <laughs> if if you're hungry for the word, it, you're not, it's it's not too long, is it? If you got something else on your mind, <laughs> if you got something else on your mind, 
What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. So when do you believe you received it? When do you believe your prayer is answered? When you pray it. Yeah. If you're going to receive it. Because it says if you believe you receive it, you shall have it. Now Jesus, uh, somebody needs to hear what I'm about to say. Because I wasn't planning on saying what I'm about to say. Maybe it's me, I don't know. But when Jesus said those words in Mark 11, which has been a faith message for hundreds of years, like Brother Hagin, you know, he preached it for 60 years, I guess. But they asked him, when are you going to give us something new? You're still talking about Mark 11. He said, when you get this, <laughs> yes. when you get this, we'll go on to something else. But he said, well, Mark 11 gives this account, and most of you have heard this hundreds of times, but faith comes when I hear it. it. They were on their way on a journey and they were spending the night in one place and they were on their way somewhere else that morning. And the Bible says that Jesus saw a fig tree afar off in the distance. He saw a fig tree and it said he was hungry and said he just went over that, I'm paraphrasing, he just went over to that fig tree to see if there might be something on it to eat. Don't you know that Jesus knew whether there's something on that fig tree to eat or not? Yes. He had all these disciples with him. These people that he was training for the ministry and to do God's work after he left. He said, I'm the lie of the world, but you're fixing to be the lie of the world because it's profitable for you that I go away so the Holy Spirit can come. So he's, he goes to the fig tree, raises them big fig leaves up, looks under there, there's no figs. Watch, watch. Nothing neat. Jesus... Now, it says his disciples was listening to him. You know, I'm hoping that if I was following around with Jesus for three and a half years, I'd listen to everything he said. Well, they were listening to him. And he, he looked at that tree and he said to the tree, he said to the tree, no man will eat from you ever again. He spoke to the tree and he just went on his journey. Watch this. Now, it was a situation where there were apparently no vacant rooms where they were going. I'm, I'm just saying that. So they had to go back to where they had spent the night the night before. Right? That morning, he looked at that tree and said, nobody will eat of you ever again. And on the way that afternoon, they went right back past that tree. Here's the tree. Jesus cursed it that morning. That evening, before dark, the tree's still there. The tree still looks the same. The tree's still green. It still looks like it's thriving and prospering. Nobody says anything. Nobody says a word. The next day, hallelujah, 
The next morning, here they come again, headed to the city again. They're going by there, and Peter, you know, he's always jumping to conclusions. About like you, probably. About like me. Peter says, Lord, now keep in mind, when you read that account, it said Jesus looked at that tree and says, no man will ever eat of you ever again. And, the, and it says, and his disciples heard it. His disciples heard the Lord talking to the tree. Are you with me? Went back that same day, looked the same. Next morning, here they come, 24 hours later, or a time period passed, we'll just say. Here they come. Peter said, Lord, look, that tree you cursed yesterday. Watch this. It's dried up from the root. When he spoke that word to that tree, it looked the same. Nothing changed. It was still green. Peter said, it's dried up from the roots. Honey, baby, look at this tree. It's dried up from the roots. You spoke to it. It's dried up. Not from the canopy. Not from the branches. Not from the leaves. It's dried up from the roots. Underneath the surface where nobody could see that the word of God was taking effect and starting to do what God said it would do. Now, if, they, if Jesus would have, that afternoon when they came by, he cursed it that morning, that afternoon he came by, what if he would have said, oh man, that fig tree, there ain't nothing, it's, what I said, it's not affecting it. Uh, blah, blah, blah. My prayer didn't work. Come on. My, no, he didn't say that. He, he didn't take back his words. He just kept walking by faith on what he had said that morning. And it was at work where you couldn't see it. You couldn't see what was going on. But it was at work. Now what if he had said, I'll take back that. It didn't work. No, he didn't. He kept walking by faith. Just like he told Jairus, Jairus when he come in, they said, your daughter's dead. Leave the master alone. Don't bother him anymore. He's he didn't say a word. He ignored what they said. See, sometimes you got to ignore what well-meaning people say to you. Amen. Come on now. Yes. You need to ignore it, but keep believing. Jesus looked at Jairus and said, when they said, don't bother the master, your daughter's dead, he looked at Jairus and said, your daughter's not dead. She sleeps. In God's language, Death is temporary anyway. In God's heart, death doesn't mean anything. But he said, don't just, he turned and looked him in the eye and said, just keep believing. Just keep faithing. <laughs> just keep believing. And you know the story. Jesus took her by the hand and said, arise. But, he, you've got to understand that when you speak this word or when it's prophesied, see, his gift didn't manifest when it was spoken. Now, that's not impossible. Miracles happen. Start your impossible. Let me do a Toyota commercial. <laughs> But it went to work where you couldn't see it at work. 
this book I'm trying to tell you. It went to work, listen to this, it went to work in the invisible realm. Yes. And then, because he was walking by faith and didn't doubt in his heart and didn't change his confession, it manifested and came to pass. We're making any sense. Thank you, Lord. Timothy, you know, the story of Timothy that I told you a while ago, he was determined to walk by faith and stand on the Word of God, even though they beat him to death. They beat him to death with clubs, or beat him almost to death, and he died from the result of it. Timothy was willing to give his life for this word of God. I'm going to stake my life on this word of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Words, I said a moment ago, words can wound, words can heal, words can empower. So it's important the words that we speak as we go into this new season, this new time, this new year, if you will. We got to keep speaking the right words. And now, one of these days, one of these days, these things that you're hearing is going to click. You might walk out of here today and say, I don't know that stuff. Let me tell you, when you say that stuff don't work, you just prophesy it. When you say that, that prayer didn't work. That confession don't work. It don't work for who said it don't work. If you said it don't work, it's not going to work for you. That's right. Are you with me? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Are you, have you had enough? He said, meditate on these things. Give yourself wholly, completely. He said, just give yourself completely to this. I know I'm going a little over, but the kids is having a party. That's okay. <laughs> hey, listen, you should be me when I let church out early. Them kids attacks me. <laughs> they don't want to get out early. <laughs> he said, meditate on this day and night. Medi have you read a promise of God in the Word of God that seems kind of hard to believe for you? In the, so you got to stick with that thing till faith comes in your heart to believe that. He, he says, meditate upon these things. He told Joshua, meditate day and night on the Word. Day and night, I always say that. Rest of the time, you can do whatever you want to. But he said, do it day and night. I don't think there's much time left. Stick with this word. Stick with this word. And it says that that profiting may appear. He said, if you'll stick with this word and neglect not the gift that came through the word, he says, you're going to see it, it's going to save you and it's going to save them that hear you. Let me give you one more. Can I give you one more verse? Yes. Y'all are the greatest people. First, First Timothy 6. says, Be thou, O man of God, 11 and 12. Be thou, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. These are other things he's talking about. Love of money and stuff. Flee these things, follow after righteousness. God, follow after godliness, follow after faith, follow after love, follow after patience, follow after meekness. Verse 12, he says, Fight the good fight of faith. Fight 
I don't know about you, but I used to like to fight. Before I got born again. Now it don't hurt as bad. <laughs> but fight the good fight of faith. So faith is a fight. I'm giving you some simple stuff right now. Faith is a fight. Do you believe you're going to receive something impossible without a fight? <laughs> it's not going to happen. You're going to have to fight the fight of faith. One good thing about that fight, it's already been won. Amen. Jesus Woo. already won it for yes. us. Hallelujah. He says, fight the good fight of faith. And I'm about to close, I promise. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Wherefore thou art also called and have professed or confessed a good profession or confession before many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. Let me read that in the Amplified. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life to which you are summoned and for which you confess the good confession of faith before many witnesses. Thank you, Lord. Lay hold of eternal life is not just a casual statement. When Paul wrote those words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when he said lay hold, or when it was translated does lay hold, what he said was, or what, it, what he said meant was, seize eternal life. Seize it. Have you ever heard of something, I, I, I know Dustin has, have you ever heard of something seizing up? When something seizes up, you can't move it, can you? It's locked up. It's frozen on there. So when he told Timothy to seize eternal life, he said, you're going to have to lock on to that. You know, uh, I... I've trained some pretty good cattle dogs in my life. And one of the things you've got to teach them is when they bite and when not to bite on the, their quarry, the cattle that you're handling and moving. But also you've got a really good dog like that that's really good at it. You've got to teach him when he bites something to turn it loose. Because I had a 10 month old puppy one time in the pen working some cattle and one, one of them tried to run over him and he grabbed it by the nose. And shut his eyes. He just grabbed it and locked down. Stuck his feet out like that and had this 400 pound calf by the nose. And they was just standing there, a calf bellering and a jumping, but I mean, somebody had you by the nose. <laughs> he seized that heifer by the nose. And I had to get in there with him and that heifer and prize him loose. And that was a border collie. And a border collie is not supposed to be too rough, but he was pretty rough. He seized that thing. He was refusing to turn it loose. He locked down on it and said, I'm, you tried to run over me. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for this dog. <laughs> I'm giving you the interpretation of what he was saying. 
you tried to run over me and hurt me. Now I'm going to put a hurt on you, and I'm not turning loose till you know who's boss here. I mean, <laughs> do what? Yes, yeah. And I saw that same dog just one, one just run, trying to run and break out of the pen, and he come swinging around there and jumped through the air and locked on the one's nose and just threw it on the ground. And there he was, laid on the ground, and the calf laid on the ground. Wouldn't turn it loose. I had to get him loose again. He finally learned it was better to turn loose. <laughs> he finally learned it's better to get in there and just <laughs> give the animal a little discipline and then back off and let it have an opportunity to do what it's supposed to do. <laughs> but he, he just, he was going to seize that. And he did. Have you ever had an engine to seize up and lock up? Paul said, you young man of God, I've been teaching you about this eternal life, now you seize it. Has anybody listen to me? When, I, when we get up in the morning, go to the bathroom and look in the mirror or I've got a mirror right beside my bed where I can talk to myself when I you know when, I, when my feet when I turn around my feet hits the floor I'm seeing myself in the mirror that guy there gets a lot of them sermons that guy in that mirror he gets preached to a lot he, he hears the word of God Get up in the morning and look, look at you and say, today you're going to seize eternal life. Amen. You're going to lay hold and you're going to turn it loose and you're going to have life in abundance to the full. Now, the Amplified Translation of John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy Who's the thief? The devil. devil. He said, but I have come that they, that you, might have and enjoy, might have and enjoy life to the fullest till it overflows. I mean, he's ready for that. Yes. Thank you, Lord. But just go ahead and get it. Now, see? Yes. I'm, this is my close. I got to give you a racehorse story. And uh, this is a short one. Real short story. Uh, I read this story about this gray horse. His color was gray. You know, in the racehorse, thoroughbred racehorse world, for years a gray horse was considered bad luck. Yeah, they didn't like gray horses. This, uh, Sister Leslie, this, I read this story about this gray horse. He was just, uh, just a big clown when he was a colt. Just playing around, nothing serious, not mean in any way, but just a big clown. Just always into something, never backed his ears or never bit or kicked anybody or anything. Just big enjoying life. And they tried to train him and uh, tried to train him and he was just still having a big play day. That was all life was to him. When that horse turned four years old, see, a thoroughbred's life usually begins as a two-year-old. You know, they start races for two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and then mature horses. But he uh, is a 
two-year-old, he didn't do very good. He did terrible. He didn't win anything. He just wanted to play around instead of running. Instead of running. When he was four years old, four is a, a number. <laughs> we know about a number. Four, if you're not into numbers, you need to be. You need to get into numbers because God's in the numbers. The numerology, secular numerology, and, uh, and all the metaphysical cults that's numerology, that's some copycat from the devil. God started this a long time before they did. The number four has to do with appointed times and advancement and promotion. And when that cult turned four years old, the trainer said, I'm working him in like, you know, groundwork, exercising him and stuff. And he was at the racetrack. Most of them, they keep them in barns at racetracks. He was at the racetrack and he was four years old, had him out in the area working with him. And he said, he had just turned four years old and he was playing with him. And all of a sudden, this horse stopped. He threw his head up and he started looking at the stands where the spectators sat. And he said, something changed right then in that from full, from baby to four years old, he was just a clown, just a mess up. But all of a sudden, promotion came. All of a sudden, an appointed time came. Number four is appointed time. Number four is an encounter with God. It means an encounter with God. When he was four years old, something hit him. He looked around at those grandstands where people would sit and be cheering him on to win a race. Of course, there was nobody in the grandstands when this happened. That day, something changed. That gray horse became famous. That gray horse just retired the other day. Retired a winner. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember right now. I'll look it up though. I was trying to think of it. I said I can't think of his name. But uh, there, there was an article the other day I read about him. And uh, he, he's retired to the good life now. Because one day, something clicked. One day in our lives, there's things going to click and things going to move us into that appointed time, that appointed place, that divine appointment. It could have been today, your divine appointment or a divine appointment. You have opportunities for many of those in your life. It could have been the day that you had a divine appointment, that something clicks on the inside of you and you start seeing things different than you've seen them before and start hearing and understanding words from this word written and spoken that you didn't understand before or it didn't line up and click or mesh with something but today that changes. Yeah. Amen. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We need to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Anybody have anything? Anybody need anything? Thank you, Lord.